Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about the challenges of keeping communities healthy during the pandemic and beyond with guests. Tanya Barber, President and CEO of Caring Health Center in Massachusetts, and Krista Zodet, President of the Health Well Foundation in Maryland. So thank you both for joining us. This is such an important discussion. We're trying to highlight sort of the workflow, the funding flow, the, uh, the flow of, of good health uh, caring that comes out of the American healthcare system, but also some of the challenges that we face. And we've seen communities across the country ravaged by COVID, and it really does start to highlight how our health care system works and where the weaknesses are. So Tanya, could you start us off and just talk about uh, caring health and tell us what your day looks like in the day of your staff in this period. Sure, good morning, Mark. Thank you for having me. At Caring Health Center, like many other community-based uh, organizations or community health center, it, every day is an uphill battle. Uh, it's, biz it's not business as usual or as normal, what we would call normal. It's now a new normal. Um, every day when we walk in, it's boots on the ground, uh, all hands on deck, not knowing what you're coming into at any given time throughout the day. Some of the challenges that we face here at Caring Health Center, so Caring Health Center is a community health center with 256 employees. We have um, a, a large refugee population and a large immigrant population uh, with our patient uh, population. But um, some of the struggles that we are faced with is you know, not knowing when you walk in, how many staff are gonna be available, who's testing positive, who's been exposed, um, you know, contact tracing, how do we get in uh, touch with individuals and then quarantine, uh, quarantining staff or patients testing positive. It doesn't matter the time of day, I'm constantly um, getting text messages to inform me that employees are testing positive or patients are testing positive. And then how do we pivot? Uh, Normally you can plan, in the past, you could plan a, what a day would look like today. It's almost impossible to plan what a day would look like because you're constantly having to pivot, you know, and, and change and add new workflows and processes and put them into place. Not to mention the staff shortages, you know, um, with closure of schools and daycare, you know, we've uh, experienced a lot of shortages like everyone else. And, um, you know, our hands are just strapped in terms of trying to provide the health care. And then in addition, um, we, of course, financial struggles, as with everybody else, you know, other community uh, organizations, you're facing struggles with trying to, um, you know, meet your finances on a day-to-day -day basis as well. So it's a perfect storm. You have, and this is the thing that we all need to understand in this pandemic, particularly when you're dealing with marginalized populations, you are not only trying to provide health, but you have to self care because your own people are becoming infected. When you're talking about positive, you're talking about people who themselves might catch COVID trying to help the community who is vulnerable to COVID and their, their money issues, their secrecy issues when you're dealing with people who are refugees and immigrants, you've got some real, real issues of fear and, and an underclass. Uh, Krista, uh, talk about how you're experiencing these, this situation from where you sit mm -hmm. in Maryland, because you're, you're talking about uh, you know, a different part of the country, but there's a lot in common with what Tanya's experiencing, isn't there? There certainly is, and I, I appreciate everything that the folks who are boots on the ground are doing um, right now. We Healthwell is in a little bit of a different situation. We were able to go 100% remote um, back in March of 2020, um, mm -hmm. even with our contact center overnight, um, and, and we've been able to continue answering phones and helping patients and getting them enrolled into our program. And you're um, on the funding side, so could you just quickly just describe where you fit into this? Because the the funding side is part of this picture. So could you just describe what you actually do at Healthwell? Sure. So we provide um, premium coinsurance, deductible copay assistance to eligible patients in certain disease areas. So um, we accept donations um, 
and they're earmarked for certain disease areas. And then through our networks of strategic uh, nonprofit partners, providers that we are familiar with our program and pharmacies that are also familiar with our program, they refer patients into us um, to get them enrolled. And then we help them through grants um, that, are, that are active for about 12 months at that point. Um, in terms of funding, I think, um, you know, we've heard the news reports that, that the nonprofit community has really been challenged in 2020 with fundraising. Um, different models, uh, different business structure, different donation processes. Um, so we totally recognize that the nonprofit community has been really kind of hurt and, and affected um, by that, by, by COVID. Um, Healthwell, because our business model is a little bit different, just we get um, most of our donations do come from the pharmaceutical companies. Um, we've been able to actually exceed our revenue in 2020 over 2019, um, which is great because we've been able to do what we can to help patients. Um, and we've basically um, been really kind of watching this whole thing um, unfold. And we recognized back in March that there was gonna be some significant issues with patients who were losing their jobs, couldn't, couldn't go to work because we were in, in, in lockdown. Um, and we were concerned, well, what about their food situation? What if they can't get gas to go get tested? What if they're, um, you know, they're furloughed? How are they now without a job going to pay their premiums? Is there, you know, are there things we can do? These are our wheel, you know, this is our wheelhouse. Um, so we set up an ancillary fund for COVID um, patients, um, actually not COVID patients, for people who were, you know, struggling with the quarantine, um, putting food on the table and people who were struggling with their premium assistance having lost their job or been furloughed um, so that they could keep their insurance, especially if they were, you know, had a chronic illness or, or cancer diagnosis that they needed to continue treatment for. So we were able to, again, appreciating Tanya's uh, point about pivoting through this whole thing, pivot, pivot, pivot. We've been, you know, just really working to address where we can in, in our wheelhouse. We were able to open those two funds um, and help over 9,000 families. Um, and we recently launched a behavioral health fund for frontline um, healthcare workers as well to help with kind of their um, counseling costs. If there's medications, those co-pays, um, travel costs to and from, um, you know, different uh, therapies that they might see. So it's, I pivot is, a, is an excellent word, Tanya. Thank you for putting that out there. <laughs> it's a lot about that. So, so Tanya, um, we, we got a question from one of our audience members, um, and it's, it's really um, interesting. You know, people are sometimes afraid to take, to get vaccinated. Um, how do your uh, people feel about this, about getting the, the, the various vaccines? Sure, Mark, thank you for asking that very important question. We also are dealing with the same concerns here at Caring Health Center from a patient perspective, as well as from staffing perspective. Right now, of course, we're in the phase two, so we're only administering vaccines to 75 and older and of course, uh, frontline staff. However, we have conducted surveys. Of our employees, of the 250 something uh, employees, we've only been able to administer vaccines to about 40% of our, our employees because the fear, the fear of the unknowns, people are afraid that they're gonna get sick. People are saying, hey, well, I'm just gonna wait for someone else to get vaccinated first and then see what happens to them. Then of course, there's the religious concerns. And then of course, we know the community of color, there's uh, definitely been a heightened concern with the communities of color, given the experiences that you know happened in the past um, with the communities of color. So we're dealing with those same challenges and we're trying to educate patients, uh, especially let's talk about the ones who um, don't speak English, right? So our immigrant and refugee pop population, we are a, a trusted provider where our patients, you know, because there's a lot of information that's out on social media everywhere. And the patients don't know what to believe and who to believe. So as a trusted provider, we're trying to educate our patients, making sure that we're getting videos in their languages, um, information in their languages, and to just communicate with them to give them some assurance that, you know, it's okay, of course, you know, to have those questions, but then, you know, of course, as with everything, there's choice, right? But we, we're trying to reach herd immunity. And so with that, we're trying to make sure that we're educating our patients, um, you know, to get that vaccine. But again, there's a huge sense of fear and 
it's a constant, constant uphill battle trying to communicate the information. We have town hall meetings regularly with our staff, but even with all of the town hall meetings that we've had with our chief medical officer, we still have a good number of employees who are hesitant in receiving the vaccine. You know, we, we just finished a poll in which we asked um, uh, people to characterize uh, American health insurance and the payment systems. Um, nobody thought it was fine. Half of the people felt that it was too costly. The rest felt it was too complicated or not available for all. How do we deal with this? I mean, it seems like we have two massive gaps. One is cost, which also translates into availability, right? And the other is the information deficit, right? How do we, how do we educate people into the use of vaccines and those kinds of, of, of things? You know, in a sense, Krista, you want to be put out of business, don't you? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. How, do we, how do we end up putting more resource into the tip of the spear, the Tanya's, and less resource into the administration of, of, of the funding process? It seems to me that the administration of the funding process inadvertently kind of embeds these inequalities. And we, you know, we talk about equality in this nation, but it seems like we are constantly creating structures that, that place equality out of our reach. Christo, if you were to look at how, the, how you could put yourself out of business, mm -hmm. how could that happen? How can, how can we put your organization out of business for the good reason that it's just not necessary, that we do have a rational funding system? I wish I had an answer. <laughs> um, I, you know, we, we Tanya, talk I'm a lot. I'm ask you the same thing. How do we put uh, Krista out of business and make sure, you know, all the money comes to, you know, to, to you, but Krista, go ahead. Right. Yeah. I would say, I mean, we, we talk quite extensively, our staff um, with our board, um, and we look at it knowing that the there are policies that need to be improved and new policies that need to be made. Um, you know, we, we don't um, kind of advocate for any particular position or concept or, you know, um, avenue of fixing the, the whole system, but um, we're really committed to being here as long as we are needed. So would love to be out of business because that means we're not needed anymore. Um, then we'll go find other ways to put good into the world. Um, but it, it is really challenging. And I, I would say that my experience through HealthWell has always been, we, we have our, our grants are 12 month rolling, but everything resets in January. And, and you can almost feel the the tension building when patients are calling us toward the end of the year, because I have to get ready for this to all reset in January. Um, and, and I think that is a huge challenge is that, and understanding that insurance needs to be funded a certain way, but is there a different way that could be a little bit better and not so burdensome on patients in that January timeframe? Because it, it, it comes in and it's like a tidal wave uh, of need that's very front loaded on the beginning of the year. Um, and, and that's, I, I think it's really scary for, we help a lot of Medicare patients. Um, it's very scary for them because they have to figure out how they're gonna make it through the donut hole to their catastrophic coverage. Um, and that's a, that's a big challenge for a lot of folks is that reset at the beginning of the year. And Tanya, in, in terms of the, the annual uh, experience that you have, do you have times when it really gets tough? Is, is, is there a funding uh, sort of season that you confront? There, there has been this winter season, which has been terrible uh, for COVID. Um, tell us a little bit about how you, um, you deal with seasonality in your work. So we're constantly advocating, right, for funds because of course it does get tough. We have um, patients who are struggling to go back to um, what Krista was saying and putting Krista out of business or uh, health you know, insurance is out of business. I think everyone in America deserves equal treatment. Everyone deserves an opportunity to have access to affordable healthcare, regardless of their economic um, status. You know? And I think that is so important. And we look, when we uh, look at that you know, as, as a country, when we look at that to make sure that everyone has access to healthcare and not um, have to 
uh, decide whether or not to put food on the table, whether or not you know they have enough money to go and buy medication, I think then we'd make great strides. So of course, you know that has to go, of course, with new policies as Kristen stated. Um, and then to your other point about the funds, we're constantly trying to um, reach out to individuals to um, see if they'd be interested in giving those dollars, giving the, the, the funds to support such a great cause, such a great need, because there are um, individuals that are uninsured. There's individuals to Chris's point that, especially the immigrant and refugee population who they've already come into our country, they're already feeling isolated, and now they have to um, remain isolated even more so. So the fear of going out to the grocery store to get food, and then not to mention that they don't have the funds to uh, get the food. Or how about, you know, they live in dense housing and so they can't even separate. And so being able to have the funds to provide uh, mattresses or over-the-counter medication, you know, to those families. We've been working with foundations who have been very supportive and helping us to get those dollars, to get it into the hands of uh, patients who have a need, you know, for uh, those types of, you know, supplies in their homes. But funds are definitely needed. I mean, even now when they're talking about um, standing up vaccine sites and they're talking about mass um, vax sites, what about the locations that those sites are being erected? They're placed in areas where patients can't access them. They have to get on uh, use public transit. Public transit is already, a, that's another space where you really can't socially distance, right? So now they have to get on the bus or try to make their way there. Funds are needed to erect these vaccine sites. For a community health center who already works on or has thin margins, we need those dollars. We want to be able to um, administer vaccines, not just to our patients, but also be able to open up to the public. So we need uh, resources. We need human resources, and then we need uh, funding resources. We need the dollars and then we need volunteers. We're short staffed. The hospitals are short staffed. You know, we're all trying to figure out, you know, how to make this work. How can we come together collectively to, you know, redeploy, you know, folks to be able to uh, provide this service that is so needed and funds and resources are key to make this happen. Chris, you and Krista have, have really pointed out something that is so important. You, you do it in different ways, but this idea of what, what is the definition of health, right? It's not just physical health, it's mental health, right? It, 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 it kind of shifts with needs because it could be housing, it could be food. Um, it could be um, uh, the issue of, of trauma and how do you deal with, with trauma? You know, the, uh, it could be uncertainty. We can't become, the, the nanny state that people talk about. Um, and, and people who, who talk about that have a point. However, we, we can't take care of each other as if we are part of one family because we are. So how do we get there? Uh, let's talk about the coalition that has, has um, gelled around uh, you, Krista, and you, Tanya, of different people who are part of your network, your partners, uh, the hospitals, Tanya in your case, and, and the insurance company, Krista in yours, and also uh, other organizations. What are the most important players in your world? Tanya, let's start with you to ensure that, that you can keep going. Um, and what other uh, needs do you have beyond money? Uh, what other needs do you have for partnership? So some of the key players, the Mass League of Community Health Centers, have, they've been very instrumental in trying to secure funds for community health centers who are struggling. Not only, you know, let's set aside trying to set up a vaccine site, but just the day-to-day -day struggle to maintain as a community health center to provide safe space for your employees and then also safe, a safe space for patients to come in. Also partnering with the, the hospitals, partnering with the hospitals, with um, community-based organizations, just collectively everyone together with the schools, you know, Labor Board of Health, just everyone coming together, partnering together, pooling our resources together and, you know- Sharing. Sharing, exactly, sharing. It's, you know, I always use the, I, I, the, and the philosophy of, it's not about competing, but it's about completing. Now's the time that where we complete each other, where we work together for the greater good to try to, you know, get what we need and that is to get you know this um 
COVID, you know, down, get the numbers down, as you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, getting those numbers down. We know that a number of people have passed away and we know that the disease itself has stopped spreading. And Mark, you, you made a point earlier, we talked about masks. It's very important for social distancing and it's very important for masks. I went to church uh, Monday, I mean, Sunday rather. I decided to go, you know, I've been in the house, my husband and I for quite some time, we decided, you know, it's Valentine's day, let's, let's go visit a church. I'm not gonna mention the church's name, but I went to go visit a church. And when I walked in to the sanctuary space and it's relatively large, no one had masks on. No one had masks on. I was really disturbed by that. You know, I had my N95 or my KN95 and my husband. And we sat there and we finally decided that it was time to leave because I said, I can't stay here as much as I want to stay. I can't stay here because no one is wearing a mask. To your point again about um, funds, I, I can't stress that enough. You know, PPE, let's talk about protective, you know, equipment that we know that prices have gone up astronomically because of the demand and supply. But, um, you know, just to make sure that you're able to, um, create the infrastructure, you know, put in, you know, like when you talk about facilities to be able to, I mean, Karen Health Center, when we came in here, the organization inside the infrastructure looked one way yesterday and today, it looks completely different. Where do we get the monies to set up telehealth? Where do we get the money to make sure that you're buying the equipment to deploy to your staff? And we don't have the luxury of working 100% remote because we're a healthcare provider. We have to be here. So how do you divide that up? The social divide, how do you get the, um, you know, the equipment to the community? Those, so we're expanding telehealth, but we also know that everyone doesn't have access to telehealth. We know that, you know, there's the audio piece that's missing. They might have the telephone, you know, and even with that, they don't all have access to that. Well, they might not have the language, right? They don't have the language capacity, right? So there's the interpreter or the telephonic phone service. There's a whole lot of variables, you know, that you have to sit at the table, pull all of these things together because, you know, I might think of something that Krista didn't think about or Krista might think about something that I didn't think about. And I think it's collectively us coming together, you know, pooling our resources, sharing our resources so that we can, um, you know, do what we all are so passionate about doing. And that is to, get our community healthy and, and get everybody back into a safe place. Krista, are you finding that your, your, um, your funding configuration has changed in, as COVID has unfolded and that the gaps that you are filling, that, that you're filling different gaps than you were previously? Um, that's, it's a little bit challenging to say just because um, our mandate is to, to get in the donations and push them out to patients as quickly as possible. And that, that hasn't stopped. Um, and it's so, and because everything is earmarked for different disease areas, uh, it's hard to say whether or not COVID has really impacted, you know, increased or decreased that volume because it just is based on the disease areas that we support. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I do think that it is a little bit different in that, you know, what we're, what we are focusing on, and, and we certainly see things differently with our COVID funds. We've got three now, um, we had a, of a premium, like I mentioned before, the ancillary and then the behavioral health for the frontline um, uh, healthcare workers. Um, and those have been really different just because the way that it has been actually kind of pulsed out to the community um, through our nonprofit partners, um, is, is very different. Um, and I would say that the ancillary kind of, kind of made us like, you know, wow, um, because when we launch a fund, we do press releases and our nonprofit partners push out the information to get help us get patients in so we can help them. With that one, with that instant ancillary cost uh, fund, we found out that there were actually public service announcements that were being pushed out in local communities. Say, hey, you know, there's this foundation, give them a call. If you qualify, you can get $250 to help with groceries. Um, so I think there was a you know, a re recognition that there was a different level of need and it was very grassroots, um, at that point it was kind of, um, which was great. And we were able to help so many people, which was exactly what we wanted to do. Um, but it has been very, it, it where you kind of, you know, for us, where we have kind of promoted and created some different COVID funds, we're seeing kind of a different way that it's being pulsed out to the community. Um, for patients to get into us. So people are responding to you in different ways and, and they're beginning to, um, to bring people to you 
yes. um, in, in response, whereas previously you would have to push the message out. Are mm -hmm. you also finding, uh, Tanya, when you're, when you're trying to communicate uh, out into the field, are you finding that, that people are trying to fill in those gaps in ways that um, are unusual, where people are actually talking through these issues? Um, um, vaccination fears, um, funding needs, trying to reassure um, uh, their friends that they can actually come in and their, their information will be held in confidence and, and that they will receive care. Are you getting that kind of support in the community itself? We are definitely getting that kind of support in the community. I think that, um, you know, there's several advisory committees that have been set up. The mayor set up an advisory committee. We're also working with the Harvard School of Public Health and the Mass League of Community Health Centers on a RADx, which is rapid acceleration and diagnoses to expand testing. And then, of course, again, to get the information out to the community. Our community health workers, we're working with our own community health workers because you know they had that peer-to-peer -peer connection with the community just, um, you know, and, and they trust the uh, community health workers just to um, share that information and get it out. So I think that overall, I think that the community is doing a, a wonderful job in terms of, you know, filling that gap, that need to make sure that this information is getting communicated and getting out there to the public um, you know, the NAACP, uh, especially for the communities of color. I know that there's been town hall meetings there. I participated on uh, a recent NAACP meeting. So um, they are definitely trying to get the information out to um, reduce, lessen the fears that folks have about getting vaccinated. We just completed a poll and we asked whether people plan on getting vaccinated. Now, remember, this is a very select audience of people who are very involved. 10% of the people who responded said that they did not plan to get vaccinated. That's a very high number given the audience uh, that we have. And so we, we need to really think about this. It, 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 it is a opinion that is deserving of respect and, and it is important that we look at the data. Um, uh, but um, I do think that, that the solution isn't a top-down um, information campaign. It's really an inside out. It's basically us all talking to each other, working through our concerns, looking at whatever information we can get and making our own decision. Um, as, as, you look at, as you look at how we can together um, uh, move our system forward, Krista, I'm going to go to you first, and then I'm going to let Tanya uh, wrap it up since we're uh, at, the, at the end of our, uh, our time. Um, how do you see the organization, your organization, uh, Krista, um, HealthWell, uh, evolving over the next couple of years? Um, so I think, um, obviously, we have certain funds that we hope to continue um, being able to assist patients in. We look to having new funds. But I think one of the things that um, our COVID funds have, has, have really taught us is that the needs are are beyond disease areas. The needs are significant across the board for different reasons. And I think um, my staff is very passionate about finding different out of the box ways that we can help um, the patients we currently have in a different way um, or completely new patients. So I'm um, having, we call them special initiative funds, our COVID funds, we have a pediatric assistance fund so looking at ways that say, yep, we, we've got these disease area funds over here and we help over here, but this is a little bit different. This might be a little bit more than just those. It might be something different, um, completely separate than, than our disease area funds. But I think um, continuing to look at um, how funds can, you know, different funds and initiatives can really help um, because there's so many things that impact health. It's not just the treatments you're getting, it's making sure that you have food on the table and a roof over your head as well. That's, that, that's so important. And Tanya, you're on the front lines. We're on the front lines, absolutely. Mark, I would say many community health centers are struggling with trying to keep their doors open, right? Um, it, when, I, when I sit at the table and I hear other CEOs, you know, and the fact that they're trying to figure out how, I mean, and we provide a vital service to the community, especially the underserved residents, the underserved community, but yet you hear, community health centers saying that, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to keep my doors open. I might have to furlough or lay off, make some you know, very um, harsh decisions that I don't want to. So when we talk about moving the system forward, 
we would love to extend our reach. We'd love to extend our reach beyond just our patient capacity to the you know, community at large. But again, it requires funds. It, 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 you can't do it without the funds. And so I, I know I've stressed this all throughout you know, the time that we've had together, but again, I can't stress it enough that community health centers are already struggling. And you know, it's gonna take the funds, it's gonna take you know, the pooling of resources coming together so that we can continue to maintain and be able to um, continue to provide the services. We're a health safety net provider. We provide to patients regardless of their ability to pay or not. And of course you can't sustain, you know, as a, you, obviously at some point in time, you just can't sustain that way. And we need the funds to continue on. We need the resources and the human capital as well. Right, the people, um, any, any volunteers, any nurses, medical assistants, you know, anyone that's willing in the medical capacity. That's schools. I know that you know some of the schools are trying to volunteer. They have students. You know, with with community health, there's a lot of um, you know things that we have to uh, get authorized first, approved first before we can open up our doors. You know, to folks coming in. But we're working on all of that to extend our scope of services beyond you know, our, our current uh, services that we provide to get folks in the door. Um, because of course there's malpractice insurance, you know, getting folks in the door, how do you get them the, co get them the coverage, the liability coverage, but yet, you know, because of the cause it's so needed, how can we, you know, work it together where it's less um, restriction, there's less restrictions to get it done and make it happen. Um, I'm going to ask you one other question, Tanya, because John Shaw just raised a, a good point in response to my point that um, we should respect people who have different views on vaccinations uh, and talk it through. Um, and he basically said, uh, look, you know, we need to get this done. Uh, we can't just be stymied by respect. What would that, that's not his, his words, uh, they're mine, but it was, it was basically the point. You're facing this in your team right now. What do you think about how to deal with this, how to get people to grapple with this issue um, and, and uh, bring people together? Do we respect people who have different views? How do we deal with it? How do you deal with it? So I do believe that we have to respect that people have different views. We are in America, right? And, and choice, we have freedom of choice. Um, I, I do know that some practices have mandated the vaccine saying, you know, if you want to continue, you know, working here, we're making it mandatory. I chose not to make it mandatory. One, it's still in, in trial, right? It's, it's, it hasn't been approved. So you can't make it mandatory when it's still in a trial phase. So, but I chose to make it um, a, a choice, you know, and, but yet at the same time, educate, educate, educate. You know, that's the only thing I can say is educate, but to force someone, you know, I, I don't think that's the right way either because we do have, you know, freedom of choice. Thank you so much for clarifying your approach to this, uh, Tanya. Tanya Barber, President and CEO of Caring Health Center in Massachusetts, and Krista Zodat, President of the Health Well Foundation in Maryland. Thank you so much for your work. That's a nonprofit report. Attendees, thank you so much. We tried to get to uh, your questions. Really appreciate it. Everybody take care, mask up, and stay safe.